my name is Michael Goldberg, and I'm our executive director of the Veal uh, Institute for Entrepreneurship at, here at Case Western Reserve University, where I also teach in, uh, at the business school. Um, and we are thrilled to partner with our good friends uh, at John Carroll on our first joint program um, with our friend Don Winkle um, and, and the entrepreneurship um, program that he runs at John Carroll um, with Brian Mauck, who's a joint or a, a degree uh, holder alum of both of our institutions. So um, Brian did his undergrad work at John Carroll and his master's work here uh, in social work at uh, uh, Case Western Reserve University. So we're thrilled. Don, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself as well and say a few words about the work that you lead at Carroll. Sure. Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, Don Winkle. So I lead the entrepreneurship program at John Carroll University, uh, just up the hill from, from uh, good friends at Case Western. So Michael and I have been talking about this for a long time about doing some joint programming. So very excited to put this into action uh, and, and to welcome Brian. Brian's been a longtime supporter of us at John Carroll and has a, had a variety of different roles over the years with our program. Um, and uh, now in his new role, we're, we're also excited to keep partnering with him, you know, with John Carroll. So uh, it's exciting to have him here, uh, even though he might be uh, a little frazzled with newborns around. Uh, so we appreciate the program and the opportunity. Great, great. Thanks, Dylan. Um, and the format for those that are new to our um, speaker series is that we always have uh, a, a student from Case Western Reserve moderating, and we're thrilled that Juliana, who's a senior heading out on the job market soon, um, maybe after today's moderating, you know, you can get a job, you know, moderating, you know, presidential debates or great speaker series. But Juliana, thank you so much for moderating. The format will be Juliana will sort of lead the conversation with Brian. If you're on Zoom, just let um, Juliana know if, by putting a, a question in the chat. And if you're watching on or raising your hand, um, and if you're watching on LinkedIn, um, just put a, uh, a question in the comments and Doug and I will be monitoring and we'll make sure we feed them to Juliana. So um, Juliana, over to you and Brian, thank you again for taking the time. All right, hello everybody. Um, I'm Juliana, as you said. Um, so I, Brian, I just wanted to start with uh, having you tell us a bit, just a bit in general about yourself. Um, and also about what uh, PCs for People is and what work you are doing there. Yeah, sure. Um, so I am currently the uh, Chief Innovation Officer at PCs for People. Um, so I, it's kind of kind of awesome. My job is to, to come up with uh, uh, with a bit, well, largely new programs and, and new initiatives uh, that are that have some strategic value for our mission, which is a blast. Um, so re real briefly, PCs for People um, uh, is a it, works to bridge the digital divide. We do three things. Uh, one is computers, uh, devices, uh, internet, and then uh, tech support. Uh, so we do computers through refurbished uh, computers from corporations. Uh, there's tons and tons of computers uh, that corporations, when they're done with, they, uh, they just melt them down or recycle them. Uh, and they have got lots of uh, useful life still left in them. So we actually are a Microsoft authorized refurbisher um, and are able to refurbish hundreds of thousands of computers. Uh, and, and we do so. Uh, and then the idea is to do it in a social entrepreneurship manner. Uh, so instead of just giving them away uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, going out of business, uh, we are a nonprofit organization, but we have a very small nominal cost associated with them. Uh, so $30 for a desktop, $50 for a laptop. And that lets us uh, buy the parts we need to refurbish them and the, the labor to do it and makes us on, largely uh, on the whole a sustainable uh, business. All right. So before COVID, 96% of our income came through uh, those $30 and $50 computer sales, which is pretty cool. Uh, then we also do the internet, um, hotspots on the Sprint network, but then we also are building our own 4G LTE network, which is really cool. Uh, and then of course, the, the last piece is a computer with the internet uh, is worthless a week later when you get your first virus. Uh, so we do the tech support and, and warranty work to support that. Um, yeah, so that's just a little bit about, I guess, what, what, what PCs for people and, and me is. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and I want to go off for a, a second and ask a little bit about um, your your education and your leadership background. Um, you know what uh, what led you uh, to be drawn towards a nonprofit um, and uh, to your uh, uh, master's in social work. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I, um, uh, I was in the Jesuit vacuum for about a decade, which was awesome. Uh, I went to St. Ignatius uh, and then John Carroll. 
uh, and at uh, Ignatius, there was this really cool little program called Labra, um, which is at actually Case and John Carroll now, um, but it's a, a ministry uh, where students visit homeless individuals uh, who live on the street. Um, they go under the bridges and alleyways and things like that, and they bring food, but the real uh, goal is building friendship uh, and, and social relationships and support uh, with the individuals who are homeless. Um, so that was a ministry I got uh, exposed to at uh, Ignatius, uh, helped bring to John Carroll, uh, and then case when I when I went there. Um, but uh, yeah, so that kind of kept me grounded. Um, and and uh, that real Jesuit philosophy uh, uh, of, uh, of doing things for the greater good and for the community um, had always kind of been part of who I was. And uh, it was senior year of college uh, at John Carroll. And this was right when the housing for collapse happened. And uh, uh, I had all this, uh, I was all, you know, we were working with the homeless and I was up on my soapbox and I kept saying things like, if I only had the money, uh, we could fix up these homes and give them to homeless folks. Uh, and teach them how to do construction skills, it would be great. And then someone called my bluff uh, and gave us $40,000 to get started. Uh, and I joked that that was social enterprise number 0001 for Brian. <laughs> uh, so uh, I pretty quickly had to uh, uh, figure out how I was gonna run this nonprofit that just got started. Uh, so that's where I enrolled at Case uh, in the, the MNO program, the Masters in Nonprofit Organization, uh, which is a hybrid between Weatherhead and uh, uh, the, the uh, MSAS, Social Work School. Uh, yeah, so it was night classes on how to run a nonprofit and then daytime actually doing it out in the field um, and, and did that for, for a couple of years. Uh, and, and we rehabbed a bunch of homes in the Slavic Village neighborhood. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, my, uh, after that, my wife was uh, in Chicago finishing her law school degree. So I moved out there uh, to, to follow her. And um, <laughs> uh, I ran a homeless shelter for Hispanic families. I learned Spanish, um, which was interesting. Uh, and then it was time when it was time to come back to Cleveland, uh, joined uh, Lutheran Metropolitan Ministry as the director of social enterprise, which was a blast to just uh, create businesses that provided jobs and job training opportunities for a variety of folks from homeless to reentry and at risk teens. That's kind of the arc. <laughs> um, and what advice would you have to people who are looking to work in uh, management and in nonprofits? Yeah, let's see. Um, so uh, the nonprofit management, it's, it is fascinating. Uh, I think as a social entrepreneur, um, uh, there is the entrepreneurial desire to go really quick and try things and experiment. Uh, and, you know, uh, that's just kind of, you know, I mean, entrepreneurs, I, we have our business plan and life is wonderful. And then as soon as you start to execute, uh, things change almost immediately. Uh, and it's a fluid and dynamic situation, right? And, and that's where you need to be quick and, and reflexive. Um, but the nonprofit world just does not move that fast, right? Like, like in the continuum of flexibility and, and, and spryness, there is, you know, private industry and then there's nonprofit and then there's the government, right? Like we're almost, we're just a little bit faster uh, than the government. Uh, so I think that is, is one of the biggest challenges is, is finding that, that cultural balance, uh, 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 both in speed, but also in, in, in running a business that does good. Uh, keeping uh, staff and and and, uh, and volunteers focused on the mission uh, when when there is uh, you know financial metrics that are a huge pressure right so uh, our, our goal is to you know uh, at any any social enterprise but you know at PCs for people right it is uh, we generate revenue through selling computers so there's pressure to sell computers uh, but it's keeping that not as a financial pressure to like you know use car salesmen the heck out of people and they're getting computers but like you know this is our mission is to connect people right. Uh, and keeping that staff grounded in the mission uh, that drives the financial results. Great, um, that, that actually leads perfectly into my next question when you're talking about flexibility. Um, I know there's been a lot of changes with COVID and I was just wondering um, how COVID has changed your operations or um, changed some of your goals. Yeah, yeah, COVID has really, uh, uh, I think, put a huge spotlight on, on the issue of the digital divide, right? Uh, so it, it's kind of amazing um, to think that, uh, uh, I think it's uh, before COVID, kind of rewind a year and a half ago, uh, almost 70, 60% uh, of, of households uh, uh, did not, didn't have a computer in Cleveland, um, and, and, uh, and about 30% didn't have internet access, which is crazy uh, to think about. Um, that, uh, and then there, there, this idea that there are these things called internet deserts. Uh, where so like East Cleveland, for example, um, if you are a business class, you know, business customer in East Cleveland, the fastest speed you can get is three megabyte, megabyte download, uh, which is DSL, right? So there was like in the, the the evolution of the internet, there was like the squeak and squawk 56K dial up, and then there was DSL, 
and then the, those communities haven't uh, uh, gotten further infrastructure development, which is crazy to think. Um, so these problems had always been there, but they really kind of shown a spotlight uh, on the issue, right? Um, uh, there was, uh, I mean, you know, uh, uh, I think it was easy pre-COVID for, for, for uh, us rich suburbanite people to be like, oh, those kids, they can go to the library and get a computer to learn, right? Um, uh, but the reality is those kids have to take maybe two buses to get there, right? And when they get there, there's only 10 computers, three are offline because they're broken and there's seven other kids, right? So now they, you know, uh, they can't get to the computer. If they miss their bus, now they, they're last in the lab and they don't get to finish their paper, right? And these just kind of uh, issues that I think are harder to explain for people to wrap their heads around. Uh, but then when the libraries closed with COVID, right? It was, and you had to learn online. All of a sudden, these issues really got brought to the forefront. Um, so from just a straight, like hard metric standpoint, everything went up four to five fold, sometimes tenfold. Uh, so we, in 2000, the year before COVID, I don't know, it seems like it was years ago, years ago, uh, but I think it would have been 19, 2018, 2019, uh, we in Cleveland distributed about uh, 2,000 computers um, the year the year of COVID. Uh, it sounds like a Chinese calendar, the year of COVID. Um, uh, uh, we distributed uh, 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 8,000 computers uh, and similar with internet hotspots and, and all sorts of stuff like that. So it's really uh, put a spotlight on the need um, and it, uh, it has motivated both funders uh, to support it um, so again, for pre-COVID, we went from 96% earned in income to about 70% earned income, which isn't a bad thing. Uh, we don't want to necessarily be charging $30 for a desktop when people are desperate. Um, I remember this was back in April, right when the first April, uh, right when COVID hit uh, a year ago, uh, we were in parking lots distributing uh, right out of a back of a truck uh, at, at high schools. So and this was out at Elyria High School. And there was a lady who uh, had heard we were having computers, wasn't sure what the deal was. She had pawned her mother's wedding ring on the way up to the, to the, the event uh, to be able to get a computer. I was like, no, 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 go get your ring back. You know, this is, this is free, free stuff for the community. Um, so there's just a huge, uh, I think the, the amount of pressure families were under to get connected was, was, was huge. Um, so yeah, so it really just brought uh, uh, attention to it uh, from across the community. And then it encouraged people who may have been reluctant to adopt using the internet and using computers uh, to really uh, bring it into their home and, and get online. Um, so lots of challenges, um, but I think on the whole, uh, uh, it's brought a spotlight to the issue, to the work. Perfect. All right, uh, that, was, that was wonderful, thank you. Um, I, I have another question about um, just the, the internet, kind of the, um, how, uh, what, what the process was, like um, for deciding to uh, start setting up internet and taking care of that, because I'm I'm very curious about how that works and and how that came about. Yeah, how did it come out? Um, <laughs> well, so uh, it is tough. So I, you know, I there. So yeah. So to back up uh, and clarify, so we are building our own internet. Um, so like I mentioned, East Cleveland, uh, for whatever re well, for a lot of reasons, frankly, for racist reasons, uh, uh, the community has been, been, been redlined, right? Uh, they call it digital redlining. Uh, and it, it's basically, uh, where a variety uh, of, of telecom provi providers will look at it, the demographics of a neighborhood and just not see the ROI on building infrastructure in a neighborhood. So they don't, um, and, and that's not, you know, uh, uh, that is just not fair because as, as we look at internet as basically a basic utility. Uh, right, I, you know, and then the the economic barriers that come from not having it, the educational barriers from not having it, uh, it becomes a real social justice issue. Uh, so there's these communities uh, that have uh, no access to it, and then there's communities like uh, across Cleveland where they might have they might have access to a cable provider, but it's you know sixty, seventy, hundred dollars a month, and it's not affordable. Um, so this idea of having a, 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 an affordable option that is accessible to people uh, started percolating, and we have a variety of different programs we work with. Uh, so that PC through people, our, our top priority is to get people connected to an existing ISP. We don't want to have to build our own internet. We'd prefer strongly not to. Um, and I always say that if anybody, you know, uh, any, any ISP wants to come and set up shop across the street and do $14 a month internet, we would happily pack up our stuff and leave. Um, and that is an opening invitation, uh, but nobody's taken me up on that. Um, so, so, uh, we came with this idea that, you know, if there are communities where, where nobody wants to invest then then we'll go into it and we'll build our own. Um, and, and we had a, 
we started kicking that around idea. Sorry, that's our first tier, sign up people where, where it exists. Second is we have hotspots. Uh, they're on the Sprint network and it's a special kind of program where it's $15 a month internet. Um, and the cell phones work great uh, because cell phone networks aren't racist. Uh, to put it pretty bluntly, uh, right? If uh, you know they're they're wireless, they go out in a circle for several miles, and they don't care uh, if the neighborhoods are black or white or purple below them. Uh, that's that's just physics, right? Uh, it's not like uh, some of the hardware where you can pull the pole and you can be much more selective. So we have these special programs on the cell phone networks, which are great. Uh, and but even then, there's some real kind of network limitations. Speeds just aren't there. So that's where we started looking into building our own network and. Uh, doing basically the same technology that hotspots are on, uh, but playing with some of the dials um, uh, to make them, uh, right? So, you know, social enterprise versus just an enterprise, right? Enterprise is always going to maximize profits. Try to put as many people on, you know, the, the phone line as you can to maximize your profits. So we just dial that back a little bit uh, so that people have faster speed internet. Um, and then we had a hard and fast goal of keeping it at $15 a month or less. Um, so, that was how we kind of got into it. Um, and then it was a whole bunch of uh, kind of mad scientists playing uh, uh, in, in our garage and, and out in the field uh, to find out how the technology work. I mean, we were blessed with uh, uh, PCs for people as a bunch of just nerdy people. Uh, <laughs> I, I say with much affection, right? We're a bunch of nerds. Uh, so there's some raw talent there. Uh, and, and we put some time into it and figured out uh, some basic ways uh, to do the technology, but then also uh, as a social enterprise could play with that dial uh, on price and quality. Perfect. All right. I'm going to pause for a second here um, and see if anybody has any questions that they would like to ask. Oh, Michael? Great. Thanks, Juliana. Great job moderating. Brian, thank you again for doing this. For, the, for those who joined late, Brian has a two and a half week old addition to his family. Um, my colleague at uh, the Weather Ed School of Management who runs our Fowler Center uh, for Business as an Agent of World Megan, uh, Benefit, Megan Bookter, who may be watching, had her second baby two days ago, so a future play date. Um, so a lot of the work that Megan helps lead at Case um, is around um, private companies that try to solve societal problems, but they do it um, not as a nonprofit, but as a for-profit. Um, can you talk a little bit about, and it's interesting, I mean, your own journey kind of working in the NGO space to help solve problems. And um, I'm sort of curious, both, um, it, it looks like PCs for People is, is a 501c3 nonprofit. I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about, as you, as a social entrepreneur looking to solve problems in the community, the decision to try to solve those problems in this case as a not-for-profit, versus perhaps in other cases, things that you've looked at or, or other ways that, that social entrepreneurs are, are solving it, where they're starting up a for-profit business to solve, try to solve that same problem. Yeah, definitely. Um, right. So I think uh, I, I used to, once upon a time, teach a little bit of social entrepreneurship up at John Carroll. Uh, it was a fun uh, uh, evening endeavor for me. And, and I think when I, when I talked to a lot of the students, they would, they would tend to start there, right? Like, oh, is it going to be a for-profit or non-profit? I think that's like the last thing you decide. Um, and, and for me, uh, going for-profit or, or, or non-profit really, uh, I think, feeds from the business model, specifically, you know, how you're going to raise capital. Right. Um, uh, so, you know, nonprofits have grants and, and PRIs and, and all sorts of like donation and like free money available to them. Uh, but there's, you know, uh, uh, not, there's no such thing as free money. Right. There's uh, outcomes and goals and metrics and and, and with all you know, that, that come with that um, and milestones that are all usually attached to grants. And that slows you down. That lows, you know, loses loses uh, uh, flexibility. Uh, right. The idea that if you want free money uh, and you want to get it from a foundation, You've got to write a proposal, right? You've got to wait for that proposal to be reviewed. That's quarterly reviewing, and then you get the money six months. So it's six to twelve months later, you're getting the money. So, and many times opportunities have moved on, right? Um, so it's free money, but it's slow and comes with a cost. Where on for profits, uh, right? You can you can go debt and equity financing, uh, and your own your own, as long as you can justify the numbers, you're your own master uh, and, and can move much more more quickly. Uh, and even scale quicker, right? Um, uh, if you can uh, justify the market capitalization, uh, you can you can get the, the equity or the uh, uh, the debt uh, and move, right? Um, so I think that's that's the big thing. Where I've seen some really 
cool social enterprises that have scaled uh, and then been intentionally structured as a for-profit um, are, are were, were during the housing collapse, right? Where you could use the equity um, uh, that you have uh, in, in the various properties that people were uh, rehabbing and be able to use that to scale, right? And, and take some financial risk that way instead of uh, uh, grant writing and all that fun stuff. So yeah, so for me, uh, you know, it's the same kind of structure. It, it's just really, it comes down to how you're gonna get your money. Uh, right. Uh, when you want to scale, is it write a grant or is it, uh, you know, uh, go out for shareholders? All right. Uh, there's a question from Riga. Hey, uh, I'm a master's student at Case, about to finish my computer engineering. And uh, what you were saying about public policy and kind of like the redlining is something I've been reading a lot about. And my question was, um, what can you do kind of at a grassroots level to change that because it feels like PCs for people and stuff that I want to do is kind of the symptom and I wanted to know if there's some easy way to also get at the cause which is the, the policies that'll enable things like digital redlining yeah yeah no it um it is fascinating uh do I have a minute to get up on my soapbox <laughs> Yes, please. <laughs> I, I think so. And, and we've been really chewing with this with uh, with a couple different states that we work with and, and on the advocacy side of what do we advocate for? Right. Um, so a lot of a lot of the money is going towards uh, nationally investing in our fiber backbone. Right. Uh, which sounds really wonderful and great. Right. Like fiber is scalable. And, you know, you as long as you you have the line and you can keep it uh, upgrading the the equipment on each end, you can scale it almost to infinity. Right. Um, faster and faster blinks. Um, but if that how if that fiber doesn't make it to the household, if it's just making so they have fiber to the neighborhood, fiber to the block, fiber to the household, right? Um, if it's not making it to the household, which there's not enough money right now to do, even with massive stimulus coming through, uh, you're just upgrading the backbone, which is nice. Uh, but you know that goes back to you know for profits, just being for profits are always going to try to maximize uh, their profit, right? Uh, so that just means that they'll put you know and if, if now we have a capacity for hundred people, you know, what was hundred people on a line and now we have a thousand people on a line, that means they're just going to put, you know, 1500 on that line, right? <laughs> right. Uh, you know, and you're still going to have uh, uh, the slow network, right? What, what uh, I've been explaining to folks. And, and again, the, the uh, COVID has really brought this uh, to light on the suburbanite level uh, is this idea of network over, over uh, uh, network uh, contention ratio. It's oversell is the, uh, uh, the layman's term, right? Uh, so the way internet service companies make their money is they buy a gig and, and we'll say that gig costs, if you were to buy dedicated internet, it's about 2000 a month. That means I get a gig line and it's, it's sitting there idle if nobody's using it and it's all me and mine. Uh, but the way they make money is they share that, right? Uh, so they take that same gig and they might sell it to 20 different customers, 20 different business customers um, and all that stuff. And then for residents, they send it to maybe 100, 200 different customers, right? Uh, so the, that works as long as everybody doesn't use all their internet at once, right? So that's why like, you know, if you have cable, it speeds up, up to 100 megs because that's what they'll throttle you at, uh, but it's what's available based on your block, right? So, um, you know, <laughs> uh, so when COVID hit all the suburbanites, uh, we all went on Zoom and, and we all started using the internet that we had. And that's where you saw how brittle that backbone was, right? And how oversold it was. Um, so people keep saying, oh, you know, 25 meg speed isn't enough. I need to upgrade to 100. I need to upgrade to a gig, right? You don't need a gig. If you are buffering Netflix, that means you're not even getting six megabyte download speed, right? Um, which is crazy. So you don't need a gig. You just need 10 meg <laughs> that you're not getting. Uh, so when you upgrade your plan, you're not upgrading your speed, really. You're upgrading your priority, right? You're, you're going from coach ticket to first class. And that's where it becomes a social ish, social justice issue, right? The haves are able to get the priority and the have nots sit and they have the same slow speed. All right, so circle back to how do we advocate for, for a solution that doesn't, doesn't just perpetuate this problem, right? Uh, that gives you know, your, your incumbent ISPs more and more uh, capacity to oversell uh, and, and then still give that priority out to the rich and, and, and slow the poor. Um, and I haven't quite figured that out. New York is doing a really cool thing uh, where they just set a, a minimum, uh, uh, you have to have a, a $15 a month plan uh, which is spectacular, um, and, and it has to have at least uh, the federal broadband definition of 2510, um, which is great. Uh, so at least, you know, we have this definition uh, of an affordable plan that has to exist that they have to offer. Um, but again, I, my concern on the back end of that is, uh, 
<laughs> what will that oversell look like, right? Uh, you know, now they're being forced to do something they don't want to. My guess is they're not going to make it the best service because they want you to upgrade from the $15 a month to the $50 plan. Uh, so there's been some talk about having it be uh, a ping, you know, a minimum ping, right? Uh, so which is a loose uh, definition, loose, uh, loosely relating back to that oversell and how many people on it, right? Ping is if you ping your the ISP and how quickly they get back to you and it's uh, measured in milliseconds, right? Um, so having a minimum ping definition um, is a good start. There's some, you know, it, it, it uh, you would have to vary it by type, right? So fiber is going to have your lowest ping uh, cable and then your wireless uh, is all have different milestones, but it's, uh, the, yeah, that's a good start too, right? So I think some having the idea of a minimum plan and then having some sort of minimum quality standards. I think you need to have those two pieces um, when you're looking at advocacy and then specifically what do those look like? Yeah, I leave those up to better experts than me. <laughs> All right, perfect. Um, and so now we're gonna move on to a question from Marcus and then uh, Rika. Um, uh, please introduce yourself a little bit before you ask your question. Sure, thank you. Uh, my name is Marcus Glanton. I'm with uh, Growth Opportunity Partners here in Cleveland, a nonprofit. Um, and so, Brian, it's great to hear you break down these things, because I don't think I really understood how all the ISPs and the technology work. So it's great to, uh, to hear that. Just curious to hear, um, kind of as we come out of COVID, what is your organization's like top priority uh, right now? And what are you guys focusing on? Yeah, let's see. So as we come out of COVID, um, I, well, so I guess from a business perspective, uh, we are focusing in uh, on translating all the momentum we've got into something sustainable, right? Um, so we've almost triple quadrupled uh, in budget size, which is spectacular. Um, but I think, you know, not to get too down on the world, right? We all have short attention spans, right? Uh, you know, as a society, uh, we get bored quickly and move on to the next social justice issue. Um, and I don't know if it's ADD or it's just too hard to take everything in, but like, you know, how do we, we take the, uh, our brief moment uh, of national attention and make that into something sustainable, right? Uh, and, and how do we uh, invest uh, the extra revenue we've got coming in into something that can sustain itself, right? So I mentioned we went from 96 earned income to 70, uh, which is like, a, you know, a historical in 20 years, we've never been at that kind of a ratio, which is like even a ratio at 70% earned income, that's one many nonprofits would, would die for. Um, uh, but for us, it's a little, how do we keep that momentum going? Um, and then from a programmatic standpoint, uh, our big focus is, uh, well, it's been pretty uh, uh, linear, right? So right when for the last year, the focus has been getting people devices, right? Um, uh, schools needed Chromebooks and computers, uh, uh, you know, starting April 17th or whatever it was when the shutdowns happened. Uh, so we've been really heavily on, on ramping up our production, ramping up our sourcing. Uh, in Cleveland, there was a spectacular organization of the Fortune 500s. Um, because there was a time, and there's still very much is a challenge. You couldn't even buy computers, right? If you, you had all the CARES Act money coming through, districts had hundreds and millions of thousands, hundreds of thousands and even millions of dollars to buy Chromebooks, and you couldn't, right? Um, so uh, CMSD uh, had bought, I think it was 12 or 14,000 Chromebooks. Um, and and, uh, and uh, the, their, they, the, I think it was HP, I don't want to hate on anybody, but whatever, HP, Dell, whoever it was, uh, canceled the order last minute and said, no, we can't, we just don't have enough, right? Um, they, the semiconductors don't exist in China. There is, they, they want the touch screen, you know, like there's a crystalline silicate something or other that they have to mine more, right? Like the, the, the global infrastructure isn't, wasn't there. Um, so the idea, so that was where we got corporations that were retiring their computers uh, to be able to give them to us, right? And that was like the only source of computers for a little bit. Uh, so that kind of our initial response was that devices. And now we've moved into kind of phase two, which is the internet, right? Uh, and, and really scaling up. Now people have a device, uh, but they have slow internet or no internet. How do we get them uh, into, uh, uh, get that connected, right? Um, during a, another fascinating statistic, uh, uh, Cuyahoga County Library, uh, they kept their Wi-Fi on in their parking lots. Uh, they had 70,000 individuals log in uh, in their parking lot for Wi-Fi. Uh, over the course of COVID, right? Which is insanity, right? People were driving to the library, sitting, parking, camping out in the parking lots uh, to be able to get uh, internet, right? So moving people from those kind of emergency uh, uh, internet connection options into something that's a bit more, more, more permanent, right? And that is helping people sign up for EBB with Spectrum and AT&T, helping people get on the, the low income cell plans and then building our own where there's no other option. Um, and, I, and I think that's the arc that we're in. Uh, and then me looking forward, the next step 
um, that we're really starting to push uh, as a, on a community-wide and even na nationwide uh, uh, platform it, it is now we've got people connected. We've got people with devices. <laughs> we got to make sure they know how to use them, right? I mean, like, you know, in Cleveland, we, we, uh, we dumped about 60,000 devices as a, not PCs for people, but as a community, right? Between the schools and us and everybody, about 60,000 devices and, and, and internet connection into the community. And, you know, there is a wide variety of, of, of digital literacy, right? Our most common call is, from people is, hey, I just got a computer from you guys yesterday. I brought it home. I plugged it in. It doesn't work. Well, did you plug in the monitor? Oh, right. You know, and, and questions like that. People are still learning how to just turn stuff on um, and really uh, helping to, to one, uh, make sure they're doing it safely, right? Uh, not getting scammed. Uh, that's the, another great one, right? I keep getting emails from you know, the deposed king of Nigeria asking for my credit card, what should I do, right? And, and helping with that kind of safe computing and safe internet surfing, uh, but also like, you know, how to unlock all the power that's in on their lap, literally, uh, of, you know, being able to search the web, uh, shop online, banking online, uh, um, do your, your benefits, your, you know, your food stamps online, all that stuff um, is a great training uh, 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 arc that we have to move folks through, right? Um, and a lot of the people that are being connected are, are folks that have worked blue collar jobs for 40 years, right? Uh, grandmas who are, have their grandkids and, and their grandkids are teaching them. Um, but, you know, uh, and just, you know, so there's a lot of, uh, I think the next horizon here beyond the internet is making sure people uh, are, are being able to take advantage of everything that they've uh, been connected to. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. All right, uh, next we have Rika. If you could give an introduction and your question. Awesome. Thanks for thanks for the session today. I represent the Entrepreneurship Education Consortium. We are a network of 11 higher education institutions, including Pace and John Carroll, uh, with strong entrepreneurship programs. And we want to kind of work together and develop the entrepreneurial mindset in all students, regardless of majors. I have a question for you. Um, about kind of like good examples and what inspires you when you look at you know other cities how does Cleveland compare you you touched upon it a little bit when you uh, mentioned the definition of an affordable plan you know what they use in New York but I wonder you know again where do you look for inspiration who's on your team nationally and how does Cleveland compare yeah, so I'm biased. I think Cleveland's awesome. <laughs> uh, but uh, let's see. So let's see. So, na so it's pretty cool. Um, uh, so throughout COVID, uh, I was blessed with a real national perspective, right? So we have uh, physical offices in, I think, seven different states uh, now. Um, not more, nine now, but it's grown a bunch since COVID. Uh, but I believe we're at seven right when COVID hit. Uh, so, and then they were everywhere from Maryland uh, to Denver. Uh, and Kansas City, right? So really kind of uh, across the Midwest and East Coast. Uh, so it was some real variety. Uh, and it was really interesting. It's been interesting to see how the different locales uh, uh, respond. Um, and, and some are really good and some have been really terrible, right? And, and not like consistently terrible, but some aspects of it ha have challenged. Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, one of the really uh, cool examples I've been holding out uh, has been Lorain County. Uh, nationally. Uh, so I mentioned Deliria um, uh, and just in general in Lorraine County, there was a really, um, I don't know, if, so when we had, they had um, like a digital inclusion coalition, um, which is great. Uh, and that had been meeting for about a year before COVID hit. Uh, so there was like this network that was already there that we were, and we were plugged into that. Um, but the really cool thing that they did was instead of trying to uh, organize millions of dollars, uh, it was tens of thousands of dollars, but it was right away. Right. Like it was, you know, uh, it was it was uh, I, which I think is, you know, I'm kind of circling back from, you know, that that nonprofit to, you know, government type response where like <laughs> we're still waiting on our COVID stimulus checks from a year ago. Right. Like, you know, uh, that, you know that just quick, small amounts of money, but really quick and really flexible uh, is what Lorraine did uh, really early on. And that was really awesome uh, as far as a quick response and being able to, to serve folks. Um, that was one of the really cool things. Uh, uh, Cleveland's been been really, uh, uh, and Cuyahoga County in particular, have been really uh, great in organizing um, public and private partnerships. Uh, I mean, Cleveland was the national leader uh, I mentioned in, in organizing the Fortune 500, right? Um, so I think all seven, there's seven 500s in Cleveland, all seven participated and, and made the computers possible uh, uh, for, for, for the community, um, which is awesome. Um, and, uh, you know, and then there's just really, 
uh, uh, cool stuff. Uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, one of the things that they did is, is they really got organized and they bought uh, computers uh, like as a, and in bulk, right? So like all the school districts all pulled together and it was 60,000 Chromebooks that they bought, which was an order that didn't get canceled, right? Like the 14,000 from CMSD got written off, but when you're at 60,000, that's a big enough customer to get attention, right? Um, so that was a really cool, cool thing they did. Uh, Columbus is doing really cool stuff on building their own city fiber network, uh, which is really in innovative. Um, and then they have, I think, three or four different wireless pilots going on right now. Um, that is awesome to hear. Um, Baltimore is doing really cool stuff with their, their school districts and, and trying to pump out internet uh, from the school sites. So there's lots of uh, cool stuff going on um, and, uh, and, and a lot of good examples. Uh, but Cleveland's been been on the forefront. We've won a couple ones, right? We've been behind on some stuff, but uh, I'm really proud uh, of some of the great things we've been able to do. Um, and that's from organizing. I mean, there was the, the Rapid Response Fund and Digital Inclusion Fund that the Cleveland Foundation helped to do. Uh, there was uh, the, the Greater Cleveland Partnership that helped to organize uh, the corporations in a computer drive. Um, and just, you know, our sports teams have stepped up. Uh, really, really great stuff across our community, which has been awesome to see. You know, and then not to get too sappy here, uh, but there was some cool stuff uh, throughout COVID uh, to see, like, you know, these businesses all organizing and, and, and such, but, but also on a more micro level. Um, so the, the global supply chains were all jacked up, right? And just didn't have stuff. Uh, and people needed uh, little wireless adapters, right? That would go into their computers so they connect to the internet. Um, and you couldn't get them, um, right? Everybody in the world was buying them and they just weren't available. Uh, so I remember we had, uh, we were doing an event, we were distributing 150 some computers and we had like 30 of these wireless adapters <laughs> and, and you know, everybody needed one. So we just put them out in a bowl, right? And said, take it if you need it, basically. <laughs> and, you know, we don't have enough, take it if you really need it, you're welcome to it. Um, and, and it was like a loaves and fishes moment, right? Not only did we have like five left at the end of the day, uh, but there was like a hundred bucks in cash in, in the drawer uh, that, that people just, you know, just threw in there for us, right? And these are all folks that are extremely low income, under 200% of the poverty line. Uh, and they were all chipping in five bucks just to help pay it forward and stuff. Uh, so just, you know, there, there's been a, a lot of really cool moments like that across the country of, of businesses, of, of philanthropic groups, and just individuals uh, helping each other out um, and, and being awesome, right? So. Wonderful. All right. I think we have time for one more question. Um, is there anybody else that has anything that they'd like to ask? All right. Um, if not, I, I'd like to close with just asking, um, you know, uh, what what is the outlook uh, for social entrepreneurship, what do you think that either the, the government or society, just any person could do to encourage more social entrepreneurship? Hmm. Yeah, let's see. How do we encourage more social entrepreneurship? Well, I, you know, I mean, so there's, there's part of it is, is the encouraging the entrepreneurship mindset, right? Of like, you don't uh, you know, if there's a problem and you don't see an immediate solution, go make your own solution, right? <laughs> um, which is part of, you know, how I, how I got into doing the internet, right? Like I didn't see a solution I liked. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, I remember somebody asked me, you know, when we were doing it, why don't we just let XYZ provider do it? And I was like, well, I think I can do it better, <laughs> right? Um, uh, and I, and I, and I, but I, better and by better, I mean more just, right? I don't think I can have a better internet service, but I think I can have a more just internet service than some of the for-profits, right? And, uh, uh, and I think encouraging people uh, uh, to take that, that, that mindset, right? Of, there's a problem out here. Nobody else is fishing it. I can do it better. Um, and, you know, and th th there is, a, a, I don't want to say, I guess it's a little bit of cockiness, right? To say uh, that I, I can do it better than, than XYZ uh, national company. Um, but, uh, but having that, uh, that confidence and that creativity uh, to be able to look at a problem and say, hey, I think I can, I can do this and I can do it better than, than what people are doing right now. Because I think there's a lot of, uh, in the nonprofit world, a lot of, you know, and I say this with affection, a lot of do-gooders, right? A lot of folks that want to do something good with their life. Um, and I think if we can arm those do-gooders with that critical thinking and that entrepreneurship mindset, right, we can make some really awesome changes in our community. Right. And, and that's a little awkward. Right. A lot of folks get into the do getters there. There's, uh, you know, and it's even awkward for me to say this. Right. There's a lot of humility. Right. You want to be just a humble do getter, you know, uh, uh, helping serve. And they don't like to be in the spotlight. And there's a lot of timidness about that. Right. 
Uh, but that entrepreneurship stuff that, you know, uh, sees a problem, uh, gets noisy about it and gets, gets busy about a solution. Right. So I think that, uh, that kind of cultural shift, uh, and that's, what's really cool to see case and John Carroll instilling in, in, in folks and, and, uh, uh, you know, and obviously instilled a whole bunch of that into me. So that's really cool stuff. Great. Well, I was going to jump in and, and say, Juliana, thank you for moderating. That was awesome. You did a great job. I'm, I'm not kidding. Your, your future as, uh, you know, Senate debates, presidential debates, you know, combine your, your interest in political science and policy with, you know, communication. So thank you for, for moderating. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. It's great to meet some new friends, see some old friends uh, on the call. Um, Don, it's awesome to partner with you on this event. And, and Brian, thanks for being our inaugural, because I, I hope we can do more of this. I mean, I think John Carroll turns out such great uh, students and, and Don and the work that he's doing in the community um, with students is something that we really admire and are excited to do more with. And Brian, you're current work at PCs for People and um, just sharing some of the things that you did today is a great example for our students and our community. So thank you so much for taking the time.